We continue our discussion on modeling the interactions between populations of predator and populations of prey. Uh, there is a list here of pertinent literature for this topic. And um, one of the things we will consider now is a slight modification to the original Lotka Volterra model. We will take into consideration mechanisms of self-regulation in the population of prey. This may be due to resources that one species, in this case the prey, uh, needs to take into account for the sustainability. It could be space, it could be food, um, it could be exposure to sunlight, uh, really a number of things. And a known mold to take into account basic um, elements for uh, self-regulation is known as the logistic mold, specifically the logistic growth. So we now assume that the population of prey is subject to logistic growth in the absence of predators. And therefore the equations um, look in this way, you may compare that to the original formulation in which the population, the, uh, the prey, um, the, the growth term for the population of prey was simply linear. Uh, now that term takes uh, well, takes the form that is in red here, uh, in which there is still a linear term, r x1, but now there is a negative uh, minus r x1 squared divided by k. Uh, here in this expression, k is called the carrying capacity. You may think of the carrying capacity as some maximum um, number of individuals that population may sustain. And... Um, what we'll discuss next is um, what about the dynamic behavior, qualitative behavior of this, of this new model. We have just made a slight modification to incorporate self-regulation in the equations, self-regulation of the population of prey. Now we have a new set of equations. Turns out that if we want to compute steady states, all we have to do is to set equation number one equals zero, equation number two equals zero, and solve for both x1 and x2. We will find two solutions. One of them is called the trivial solution. Um, and we can easily verify those by evaluating the equations at zero, zero, and verify that they become zero. The non-trivial solution is an expression that takes this form, x1 is mu over c, and x2 uh, equals um, this expression here. Okay. So we're interested in the stability of the non-trivial steady state. We compute the Jacobian matrix, the matrix that contains the partial derivatives of the right-hand ha right side of the equations, excuse me. And this matrix takes this form when evaluated at the non-trivial equilibrium point. The first calculation we do is the calculation of the trace of this matrix, the trace is defined as the sum of the diagonal entries. In this case, we're adding up this term with zero. Since we assume that all parameters for this model are positive quantities, then we observe the trace is always negative. The determinant, the determinant is computed by multiplying this term times zero minus this uh, term here multiplied by this one. And in this case, the determinant reduces to this expression. So <clears throat> we have to remember that stability is concluded or is implied by having a negative trace and a positive determinant. Another thing to remember is that trace of a matrix always coincides with the sum of the eigenvalues of that matrix and the determinant coincides with the product of the eigenvalues. But conditions of stability will be um, in place when we look for conditions to have uh, a negative trace and a positive determinant. In this case, the trace is negative, so easily we can derive a condition for this determinant to be positive. Uh, specifically, we observe that if k times c is greater than mu, then the determinant is positive and uh, the trace is negative, which gives 
a um, condition of stability for the non-trivial steady state. So let's now verify these conditions of stability by selecting or choosing parameter values that satisfy um, such condition and computing numerical solutions. These are solutions computed, um, the curves you see here are solutions computed with the R package L soda. So in solid blue we see the numerical solution for x1 of t and dash red is the solution for x2 of t. They are displayed versus time. This is what we call time plots. Uh, you see the value for x1 and x2 at t equals 0. This is with one set of initial conditions. And keeping the same parameter values and using now a different set of initial conditions, uh, we, we calculate or obtain another numerical solution of these equations. So what, we'll, what we will do next, and it's important to remember that for every time value, say for instance at uh, time equals 80, there is one value of x1 and a value of x2. So if we now plot uh, this on the x2, x1 plane, we will obtain what is called a phase plane plot. And that's what we will do next. So in this plot in solid black, the curve in solid black is um, the curve that corresponds to the um, upper left panel, right? And um, you can clearly see what are the initial conditions here for x1 and x2 at time equals zero. Uh, another feature of these curves is that there are oscillations, but unlike the original version of the lotka volterra model, these oscillations are dumped. They're damp oscillations instead of sustained oscillations. Eventually, these curves settle or converge. Um, they're converging to a value for x1 here and for x2. And that value at which they converge is the value precisely at which the solution, when displayed in the phase plane plot, uh, this solution is spiraling in and converging into a value on the phase plane. That value is the stable steady state. Okay, And what we're doing here for purposes of illustration is computing another solution with a different set of initial conditions that is also displayed. The, the solution corresponding to the upper right panel is displayed here in dash as a dash curve with color golden, I think. Right, so there is a different set of initial conditions. However, it, it has a similar qualitative behavior with spiraling in. There are still damp oscillations, and eventually it converges to that uh, stable equilibrium point. Now, uh, we will point out that there are other modifications of the original lotka volterra model, um, similar to the modifications we just reviewed. For example, we could consider this type of expression here in red for the um, growth rate for the population of prey. Uh, this involves a parameter r, this involves a parameter k, similar to the carrying capacity. It also involves a parameter theta that's acting here as exponent. Uh, that exponent is supposed to be between 0 and 1. Um, here's another example, it's very similar to the previous with logistic growth. This is the order here of uh, the terms. Um, you could also take into consideration making changes on the attack rate or predation rate instead of the growth rate of the prey. Um, that um, here is an example by Avlev in 1961. Uh, the predation term now takes this form. And um, there is another example here of substituting the predation term with an expression that has a, um, it's basically a fraction with a numerator and denominator. This concludes our um, discussion on some um, modifications of the Lotka-Volterra equations.